Live from the Hotel Edison, Times Square Chronicles presents, I'm Susanna Bowley. And today, my two guests are Tony Award winning and at the top of their class, but they met ages ago in a show that's coming to Encores this year. We are with Victoria Clark, who's Kimberly and Kimberly Akimbo and won a Tony Award for that. And with Lori Yeston, who wrote Titanic, Grand Hotel. Nine. Nine. <laughs> Nine. Death Takes a Holiday. Which one? Death, Death Takes, takes a, a Holiday. holiday. Oh, I'm yes. Selling. I love Death Takes a Holiday. <laughs> He's also writing a new show about Brooklyn and the Brooklyn Bridge. We're talking more of Yeston. Okay, so you have to tell me how you and Vicky really met because I thought you. At met, Yale. I thought you met originally at Titanic. No, I was a boy professor. I was about eleven at the time, <laughs> and, and Victoria was a brilliant undergraduate. What shows did you do at Yale? Um, gosh, I did a, a skit at the Jones Harvey Schmidt and Tom Jones review called Garden Song with David Loud directed and music directed. Oh, wow. David Loud um, yeah. is also a music major. The great director. is David Loud. Yeah. David Tommy Loud. Kraska was there, who created PS Classics. Ted well, Sperling. Ted Sperling, who, was, who just actually, we just did an album together. Uh, it was my music, Vicky sang it, and Ted Sperling conducted the orchestra. Right. Right. We're is this music the Simpsons majors. songs? Yes. yes. Yeah, we're going to talk about okay. this. So there were a bunch of us that were all music majors when Maury was head of the department. A boy professor. Uh, yeah, when he was a boy genius professor. Right. And uh, that's where we met. And um, and then you were about the time you left to do uh, nine. Right. Where well, I nine? left to do nine. I, I'd been there for about. A, and at that time, I was I already I was the DOS. I was the director yes. of undergraduate studies. Yes. And ran the joint. And. Uh, one genius after the other came in. Yale was actually there was there still is a Yale mafia. I think that's true. All of us who were there then still constitute the Yale mafia, and there there must be 30 or 40 of us. Wait, you're part of a mafia? A mafia, the Yale mafia on Broadway. Yes, that's right. We 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 plot and scheme together. We work together. We uh, support each other. How did you not end up in nine? I was too young. I was you, when they right. were casting. I was a I, senior. She was a senior in a college. Senior in college. Oh, I and mean, I would have been. I didn't want to be an actress back then. I wanted to be a director. So it never would have. It never would have occurred to me to contact Marie Todd. And I should talk about that later too because I've seen some of your pictorial work and I loved it. And I, and I took a years a years leave to do the show from my position for nine. Yeah. Yes. And then what happened after nine? How did Titanic come? Well, Titanic was many, many years later. Oh, Phantom! Fan I forgot and Phantom. Phantom. Yeah, but after nine, I was able to afford not not to teach at Yale anymore. That was my day gig. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did Titanic come about? Well, Titanic was much later. Right. And uh, and of course, we I had done nine. I had done Phantom, and, and I was looking. I was thinking of something to do, and then I, you know, most musicals come from terrible ideas. <laughs> And uh, well, a crazy Fellini movie that nobody understands, right? I thought uh, that was genius. Well, now it is, but not before I did it. And I thought I was fascinated by the story of the Titanic. And I thought, and everybody knows it's the most famous word in the world. And then, and I started talking about it. and Everybody said, "You're crazy! It's the worst." But you know, eighteen hundred people died. And I, I thought. Okay, and then I thought about more about it, and you know, I, musicals are supposed to be elevating. And then I it was, you know, around the time when we were, you know, things were happening, and I, I thought, let me think about this. And I was, I thought, well, look, it's the British, it's the British Empire, right? They ran the world. They were, they were the wealthiest country in the world, and not only did the most business, and they were the maritime emperors of all the world. They had the biggest fleet, they had the biggest battleship, they had all of the trade. They Britannia rules the waves. And and it was, you know, 1910, 1911. And so so not only that, but they had invented the steam engine. They were also the technological forefront of the world. So with their power, their hegemony, and their why would they not have thought, you know what, what could happen that's bad? Well, a ship could sink. So why don't we take our magnificent 
cutting edge British engineering and apply it to our Navy and build a ship that will not sink to save and protect human life. And I was, I always thought, how is that any different from Jonas Fault, Jonas Salt? I want to get a vaccine so you won't get and save the world. And I thought that is a noble something to achieve. That's a dream, a positive dream. For and, I, and I was thinking about it as I was. Th oh, it's 1986. As I was thinking about it, just above my head one day, the Challenger space shuttle blew up. At that moment, and Sally Ride was killed, and all the. And what were they doing there? They were there trying to enhance and increase human knowledge and a positive dream. And you know what? And at uh, the apex of our engineering, and yet it happened. And I thought, uh huh, we haven't learned that yet. And but the, things happen like that at great risk because that's how we advance forward. And the story of the Titanic and that great dream to save life is still something worthy that I want to write about. And I started writing. And that's how I wrote, and that's how, where that came from. Everything that was positive about it. And you can actually hear, now that I think about the score, you can actually hear the technology. And you can hear, like, the, the wheels turning. The yeah. wheels turning, yeah. yeah. The, you know, and, and that's how the, 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 the show opens with that. You know, the forefront of human of human engineering. That's what we should do that. And so, You're yes, we failed. The Stoker song. But, yeah, but and we failed nobly. And then I learned all about it. You know, I mean, and the incredible amount of research, and all of that is in it. And uh, it's I just it's an elevated dream. It's you still you're uplifted by it because the dream is so elevated, and and uh, and it pushes us to go forward and say, all right. Nothing is ever going to be perfect, but if we don't, if we don't try nobly, we'll never accomplish anything. And so, that's how. Then it's done everywhere all the time. I mean, it's, now it's in Japan, or it's in Germany, or it's in Korea, it's, or in a in a college. My friend, in a Roger, months it's going to be an encore. That's right. It's going to be an I know, encore. I'm on so June excited. 20, June Annie Kaufman directing. It's going to be great. Oh, she's now, I have she a is. question. Did you write Alice Bean? That's who you played, right? Yes. yes. Um, created Alice Bean. Did you create Alice Bean okay, from Alice, Alice, Alice Bean. No. Al yes. Alice was already Alice. Yeah, well, you, you say that, but don't forget. Alice Bean I, was a name that I picked up somewhere, I think probably the, the, from the... Uh, Coffee. <laughs> no, 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 it was from the passenger list. Oh, no, I did oh, all kinds of research. So, and so I, oh, I wanted every name to be a, a person who was on that ship. Oh, wow. Oh, absolutely. And so, and I knew she was in the second place, right? Second place passenger. And, uh, and so, you must understand, a writer just makes things up, okay? You, you, you write a line, you write a song, you write, you write, you, and it's a clue, right, right? An actor takes those words on the page and those notes on the page and creates a person from it. It's, a, it's a, the, the, the relationship of a writer and a person. And, and Alice Bean, is only some words I wrote and some notes I wrote. Victoria Clark created Alice B with her creativity. The reason I, the yeah. reason I ask yeah. though is because as a composer, lyricist, writer, do you create roles with people in mind? No, because I was up there in near New Haven, Connecticut teaching or whatever and I, and I no I'm just sitting in my little room <laughs> and I said I'm going to write Alice Bean and then I wrote a song for her and I decided what she was like the I Am Dance for the First Class? Yes of no, course. that came later no that came later uh, but it was uh, the pattern the pattern it was, okay. the first class pattern I needed to I, I needed to give, give the, inf the, the first of all there's so much information about Titanic you know it's like it's like a dictionary or like an encyclopedia I'm going, how am I going to get that I said alright well, what about a second-class passenger, just like my Aunt Arlene, God rest her soul, my wonderful Aunt Arlene from Fairlawn, New Jersey, she was that person, right? If she, she would look and see at who's famous, what's going on there? So, I, Alice Bean could be my person who would know all about all the big stars and all the famous millionaires. Who were oh, and so you could get ship. them all out So Alice. she'd be there with her oh, husband, God. Edgar, who's just embarrassed by her because, you know, and, and she goes, oh look, 
Oh, look, her name is Madeline. She's John Jacob Astor's second wife. She's only 19 years old. She's married to a, a man worth of $100 million and 70 years her senior, whatever she said, because she reads all the gossip. And, and by doing that, she's so not she's a, the original gossip girl. Yes, yeah, she's an adorable girl. We all know that. We all have an Aunt Arlene who goes, oh my God, look at that. There's so -and, -so. <laughs> and so there's Alice, who, who, and which Vicky created out of whole cloth. And, and, and once that happens, Alice B is created for all eternity and all time. <laughs> One of the great things about being in the theater is that we get to do something, make something up, create something from ourselves, and it's there for eternity in, in the characters that are on the page. It is the Other greatest. people come along and yes. pick them up and do what yeah. they want to oh, do. And then they do their thing, right. right. Can you tell us about your audition for Alice oh. and how it came about? Well, Richard Jones was our director, and he knew that Maury already knew me. I didn't know Peter Stone, who wrote the book. Yeah. God bless Peter. And, um, and our auditioning for Richard, in my, in my case, was very simple. It was a 10-minute it was a conversation. We just talked. I didn't sit in front of him. I didn't read anything. Strangest man in the world? Strange, strangest man. One of the strange men. Strange but brilliant. Wonderful. A visionary, I would say. Um, but a couple of other people that he had worked with, Henry Stram and Marty Moran, knew him. Um, and they had put in a good word for me, so their word was good enough for him, I guess. And, and we just had a really short conversation. Next thing you know, I got a phone call. And, yeah. So you never sang for it? No. Oh, no. that's brilliant. Well, that's what a lot of English directors do. They, they just want to know who you are as a person. Oh, because they have to work with you. Yeah, I think so. And they and they look at your resume, or they talk. They get they talk to other directors or composers who've worked with us, and yeah, they they, they figure it out. What had you done prior to that show? Oh, uh, let's see. I had done Guys and Dolls with Jerry Zachs. I had done The Grand Night for Singing. That was a Rogers and Hammerstein. Oh, I had done Smitty and How to Succeed in Business with Matthew Broderick and Megan Mullally. That's where I met Jessica Stone, who oh, directed okay. uh, Kimberly and Kimba. Um, I think those were those are the big things that I had done. Yeah, before. Is there anything about Titanic that we should know before seeing this new production? Because I know that it went to London. Because one of my oh, co-producers, yeah. Craig, is one of the producers on the Oh, are you, yo, no, yo, no it's, it's been everywhere, you know. I mean, it's, I've, I've, I've <laughs> seen it in, in Polish, <laughs> in Korean, mm -hmm. in, in Japanese. Is that fun? Yeah, that's always very exciting. But you know what? I, I, I don't think there's anything we need to tell you. I mean, you think you know the story of Titanic, and I think that's, you know, what's funny about it is that when people go to a show, you know, and even if... If, if, even if it's My Fair Lady, when it was My Fair Lady. And by the way, I was 10 years old. I don't mind, I was, in 1955, I was 10 years old, living in Jersey City, New Jersey. And my mother said, I am going to take you to see a Broadway show. And she took me across the Hudson River and I saw a show called My Fair Lady. And it was your first? Julie was 10, Julie was 20. I was, she was 10 years older than I was. And she came out and I looked I, I, all I want, and I looked at my mother and I said, I want to do this. Oh, oh wow. I knew it then. Oh, I was writing music then. Oh, and I said, that, that's, what I, that's what I want to do. I, I'll never forget it. Or, 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 or any of them. I mean, I guess all of them. I just, that was just, I was stunned that you could do that. Vicki, what was your first show and what made you want thinking, to do that? I had a similar experience. Um, I, when I was in sixth grade, a friend of mine uh, had moved here from Dallas. And, her parents, we were missing each other terribly, and their parents flew me up to New York for the weekend, and I saw um, Pippin with Ben Vereen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Irene, I think Irene Ryan was still in yes. it. Yes. And uh, am I saying her name right? Because I remember she had a... Joe Franz. Um, yes. Uh, Michael Rupert. Yes, that whole original cast. It was in the fall, so I was singing the original company. Um, that was the first show we went to see you. Story Theater. Uh, oh, Paul Sills? Uh-huh, Paul Sills Story Theater. And uh, the Russian the Russian Circus or the Dancing Bears or something. I was like a, it was a, it was like this jam-packed with shows. And when I knew when I left, it, it, something similar happened. I, I looked up at those people and I thought, well, I, I think I would like to make a living doing that. Yeah. 
I, the, uh, next time I, I saw an uh, incredible comedy soon after that, in the 1950s, No Time for Sergeants. I'm tr I can't remember the name of the act. It was a, uh, and I just, and I said, you know, it was the funniest thing I ever saw in my life. <laughs> but the thing is this, I just thought, with the, I thought that was normal. I grew up thinking all that was normal. Yeah. My dad was an agent. Oh, I, well, saw, that's well, <laughs> I saw a lot of musical theater growing up, and I was like, of course you walk and dance and sing down the street. Who doesn't do this? I, and I've always thought that way. <laughs> I have to ask you guys my, both my favorite questions. What song or cycle of songs describes who you are? A song, you mean a song? Like, like multiple songs. Oh, like like multiple songs, because there's also classical music called song cycles of Beethoven did oh, one yes. and Schubert did one and stuff like Prokofiev. that. Yeah, that's, Prokofiev did one. Uh, okay, you, you can answer the first one. I don't know. That's a tough one. I may have to come back to you. But you, you could even be an album, right? It could be an album. All right, so I mean, I, okay. For more, it would have to be an well, album. Well, well, no, I guess. Well, first of all, I think the scores of those early, sh you know, the, uh, in, in other words, uh, the, the the score of West of of, of uh, uh, West Side Story was very influent. Well, My Fair Lady, I think, is the one. I still think the uh, ultimate optimal musical is the first one. Is My Fair Lady for me? It was. It was how profoundly the score and the lyrics cre characterized, created each person, and mm -hmm. and also the world. Of, Inc. of the UK at that time, how, how a Cockney girl could be so unique, how how Higgins could be so like that, you know, how they sung made them. And now I didn't know that, I was just a kid, but I knew that instinctually, not, I couldn't describe the words about it and the words to it, but what I was learning was, you, 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 Show people what you are like by the way you speak, by how you react to something, mm, right? True. There's an explosion, one person screams and runs away, the other person goes, well, that's weird. I think I don't know how that happened. <laughs> and now you've got two characters, because how you react to things. So I know, I think some would say acting is react, you know? Uh, and, 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 that, and when you have one actor on stage, throwing something out there that could be absolutely outrageous or, or, or absolutely uh, 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 abs not exceptional at all, and the other acting behaves or acts in a way that you would never have thought of it, that, that's a character. And, and there's this language that we in the theater speak, whether it's music or lyrics or how we act, which literally makes cr creates life on stage. It's, I think it's a miracle. You know? I do and, 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 and so, that, and that's like, I think that's what we love it more than anything else. I thought, I thought of, um, I don't know if it says, if it's who I am, but I remember the, the album that I listened to the most growing up was Peter Pan. It was Mary Martin oh, yeah. and Cyril Richard. I loved it too. And Cyril Richard was so hilarious. <laughs> I mean, I had, I, did, I had more fun playing his part, really, than Mary Martin's part. But I do love the lyrics to Neverland. I have a place, I know a place where dreams are born in time. It's never planned. It's not on any chart. You must find it with your heart. Never, never end. It's such a great um, marriage of voice. My <laughs> so the, you know, the, the marriage of, of lyric and, and melody I, just stunned me. I can remember, and I had to listen to that song over and over again. Of course, I love the comic stuff. And I think it's you learning by listening to these great, great actors, right? Yeah. It doesn't get much better than Mary Martin, Cyril Richard. And I loved that there was a woman playing the part of a little boy. Mm -hmm. I remember that made a huge impression on me. Really? Yes. Like, why wouldn't they cast a boy? They cast a woman. Not okay, even a, just not even a young the lady. Is how it be. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Like, no. Growing up in Dallas, Texas, where things were like a slightly behind the times, if I should say, in the 60s and 70s, I mean, like, I had to have a woman, a fully grown woman, playing a little boy. That, to me, was turning age on its head and turning sexism on its head. So, for me, that show was pretty formative. 
Yeah, I grew up in California, so yeah. I, a lot of this stuff that other people have seen, I didn't actually see. But it's from. funny about this is because I saw it the first time, you saw it the next time. Because, right. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and both influenced by all of those scores, you know. Um, but no, Peter Maury, Pan. I mean, I have to brag about Maury. He is, he is our, I think, one of, if not our greatest melodist. I mean, I it's agree. really, really hard to write Romantic. a great melody, and it's, it's getting harder. <laughs> it's because it's so, it should be simple. But it's not. It's not at all. I have to ask you two questions about the Peter Pan. Did you ever notice that the Peter Pan album had a smell to it that smelled like Neverland? No. I never noticed that. It did. I used wow. to smell it because I thought it smelled like Neverland. <laughs> and did you see Cyril Richard do Aladdin? No. Oh, really? um, you have to Google. There, he does this song from a TV version of Aladdin. That's amazing. It's really fabulous. Okay, so we have to talk about December songs. How did this come about? So, Carnegie Hall had a 100th anniversary, their centennial. And so they thought, well, why don't we just, uh, why don't we just commission uh, new compositions on the occasion of our 100th anniversary and then we'll perform them, right? So they commissioned a new symphony, a new string quartet, <laughs> a new wind quintet, a new, a new, a new everything, right? A new right. few, whatever, right? In fact, that, and then they figured, because it was all like Carnegie Hall, classical music. And then they figured, I think they, they decided they were going to go slumming. <laughs> let's, let's ask somebody to just write some songs. <laughs> so they said, will you, will you write some songs for Carnegie Hall? And so, I, what, of course, Carnegie Hall wants you to write some songs. What happens? <laughs> and so I thought, well, so maybe they came to the Broadway guy. Or maybe they just came to somebody who, of the melodist or whatever. So you know what? I'm going to fool them because I'm a professor and I'm a musicologist. And I, I've been a student of some of the greatest song cycles that, that have ever been written. There was a song cycle. It was originally, well, actually, one of the first ones was created by uh, Ludwig Beethoven. Um, he was a great symphonist, but he wrote a group of songs. That was sort of a, 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 that was sort of like a love story to a beloved, of his beloved, and he wrote it for a voice in a symphony orchestra called "To To My To My To My Far Off Beloved" on the Fernagenita. And I guess after him, uh, you know, Franz Schubert said, "Gee, what a good idea! I'm going to write a group of songs for, the, for a voice and a piano, and I'm going to tell a story." And I'm going to get my friend, the poet Wilhelm Müller, to write the story. Uh, and he wrote the words. So he wrote a story about a young man, a disconsolate, desolate, broken-hearted young man, wandering the Vienna woods. His his girlfriend dumped him. He's he's been jilted, and it's freezing cold, and it's called a winter's journey, Winterreise, a winter's journey. And the the opening song starts with the lyrics. I came here a stranger, and I'm leaving a stranger. Oh my God! And it, no, that was that's the happy part. And that's it gets the happy part. Sadder <laughs> and sadder and sadder, and it's heartbreaking. It's the most beautiful music you've ever heard. And then Franz Schub Schumann wrote one, and then Brahms wrote one, and then and then there, there's the, the, that's Lee van der Erde wrote. And so I thought, I'm and then write, more yes I'm than I'm song cycle <laughs> because it's got classical things, and not only that, but it and. Uh, It'll, the style of music that I like, it'll have so many different styles, it'll represent almost every kind of different music that was on, car, on the stage of Carnegie Hall. So I wrote it for voice and piano, and, 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 and we recorded it, and it, it had... It became, Did you always know Vicky was going to do it? I, had no. No, I, I didn't know who was going to, I just wrote it, oh. right? And then we, we initially recorded it um, with Andrew Makovici, Right? Oh. And then it started, it was, well, it's been translated into German, Polish, Italian, Spanish, Japanese, I mean, all over the world. And, and then people started doing it. It was recorded a number of times in English. And then once in French, Isabelle Georges did it in French. Wow. Des Sons. And it was in French. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then in German, and in German it sounds like Schubert. <laughs> and, and, uh, Maybe it's the sound of and, the voice. And in Polish. Uh, in Polish, it's very dark and very sad. <laughs> and, you know, and so in the same way 
that the opening song that that Schubert wrote was I came here a stranger and I'm leaving a stranger the end of you know as my song opens with the opening line but the next line is no one really knew me no, no one really knew me then no one, no one knows me now. now that was and I keep on making references to, to Schubert that way to thank him and of course he's my inspiration and so um, it had been done so often and I had a dream and my dream was that one day, if we possibly could, I would like to do this with a full orchestra, inspired by Beethoven having done the first one with a full orchestra. And it was my dream to do it, and it was my dream that the only person I could ever think of who would be up to that task and who would just hit it out of the park would be my friend, Victoria Clark, who has, I've known since forever. And, we, and you knew her voice. Of so course. Well. And we did it. And, and we did and that's how it happened. We did it. And we had a ball. And Ted Sperling uh, Ted conducted it. Conducted it. Mm -hmm. and, and and it was it was a ball. And I just think for me it's just one of my favorite things I've ever been involved in at all. You and you and Teddy and, and me doing the seminar. Tell me your memories of doing this. Well, one of my favorite memories of, was the day your son came up from Washington to Jake. sit. To Jake to sit, and I've known Jake. Yes, he was little. Little, right? yeah. little Jake. Yeah. The more he used to like haul around to the rehearsal rooms, right? Yes. Didn't he just come back from Switzerland? Yes. Jake, he's he's, he's editor of Science Magazine now. <laughs> so I walk in after a take of, I think it was. I had a dream about you and you were together again. I can't remember which song it yeah. was, and he was just. Oh. He just wasn't able to talk very much. Not Maury. Maury can always talk. No, Jake. Jake. And, and he said, you know, I've heard these songs so many times, and it's so moving to hear you sing them. And I don't know why that touched him, but it touched me that he was able to say that to me. And just, I just, you know, I wish that my son had been there, too, yes. the same day, mm -hmm. and then they would have been able to sit in the room. He was jumping out of his room. skin. I mean, don't forget, this is a kid who lives in a house where he hears the same phrase from a song being written over and over again, again 10,000 times. <laughs> right, right. And, and, and he, he knows every note of everything I've ever right, written. You know, right, This is incredibly musical. And that was, that was one of the great thrills of his life, being in the studio. That was a really oh. special day. Yes, very special. And uh, we had a great orchestra. We had really, really good musicians. Um, yeah, it was uh, very special. What was your favorite song to sing on the album? Um, and why? That's a tough well, question. Well, that's a really tough question. It's like choosing between your babies. I know, children. But I do like, I had a dream about you. I love my grandmother's love letters. Maybe that's the one Jake liked. I can't, maybe that was the one. And also, um, I love Please Let's Not Even Say Hello. That, that is a killer. The, the, mel the melody, the, that whole song is. Yeah, that's that's it. That's it. That's it. Very sweeping. Endless, connected melodic line from one to the other. Right? And it's very yeah. arranging, but the, yeah. the, the the way the melody rises and falls reflects what's happening to this woman in that moment, and it's it's very full emotionally. So I now, how did it get to PBS? Did, wasn't it filmed by PBS? I don't. But not that I know. I don't of. know. I think I so. Think no. So. No, that must no. have been Alan Menken. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think I just saw this on YouTube. We did, we did film little bits and pieces. Wait, they of must. It. They, they, I guess they filmed. They must have filmed some of. They filmed some sections of it. Of it. Yeah. See, the thing about. I watched it. Yeah. See, when you ask a question like, "What's your favorite one?" It's such a tough. I don't know where I got the first one from, but it was. Well, someone was asked that, and they said, "Well, you know, it's like the fingers of your hand. Which one would you lose?" You yeah. Know? Or like your children, you know? But which one would you also, lose? We have to talk about Larry Hockman, who, who um, oh. orchestrated it, and his orchestrations are so sublime. And his orchestration of By the River, um, crazy. That, that's crazy, because you actually hear the water, the water boiling. I actually think that's my favorite. Rushing. Well, you see, and it's, well, yeah. We should talk about Larry. So La Larry and I have worked together a lot. I mean, we're, again, when you when you have a team in your life, and, and you know, so the, thing about, the great thing about Larry is he and I share one thing in common, which is we're both schooled in classical music, and he's schooled in classical orchestration, and, and the, the the December songs are very much influenced by classical forms, right? They're they're inspired by Schubert, etc. And so Larry was the perfect person to translate that, and with referencing 
the, the classical element of it in, 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 in the sound, but also the romantic, because the romantic people like Debussy, you know, are specialized in musical tone painting. You know, when Debussy writes a great symphonic piece called La Mer, but the sea, you, you honestly you see that you see the blanket on the, the foam. yeah you see the foam you smell the, the, the dead crabs <laughs> on, right? and 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 Larry does that Larry gives you the smell and the taste and the, of being there in the same way that a great well because people like Larry underscore movies and, and that music puts you there in the same way and I think I think his I think his his orchestration of the Semper Sword is really, truly masterful that way. I mean, he paints, he is doing everything that I'm doing. He, and you know, with it, it, it's the three of us. It's what the music is, it's what the words are saying, it's how Larry painted it in the orchestra, and how Vicky brings it to life. I am so sad because our time is up. Yeah. I want to ask two really quick questions. Vicky, directing, are you going to be doing more of it? Because sure. it's really seriously wonderful. Um, Yes. Good. I don't know when or how or what exactly. I can't talk about it just yet, but something is coming up oh. next year. And I mean, here's what I've learned in my life. You know, I'm just open to telling stories. However, I can best be used in whoever. I often don't see projects coming. I never saw Kimberly or Kimbo coming. Janine Tazori and Jessica Stone approached me about it. I wasn't planning it. So I've, I've stopped trying to plan. I just, I let people know what I'm working on, and then when friends call up and ask me to do things, if I can, I, I, I'll be there. Um, that's that's my philosophy, and it's always great to spend time with Maury. Yeah. I, always Maury learn. I know about your Brooklyn musical. Oh, How's yeah. it coming? It's going great. So I'm writing a show for Japan, too. Listen, it's like every day you get up in the morning and you have something to do. Uh -huh. you know? uh -huh. And uh, uh, and uh, all I can tell you is that I can't wait to do something more. I'll we, say, we, have, yeah, we, we can't got break to. up the band. No. No. We got to do something else together. I am Thank you. so <laughs> thrilled to be presenting live from the Hotel Edison, Times Square Chronicles presents. My guests have been Victoria Clark and Maury Yeston. I'd like to thank Romel Gopez for giving us the Hotel Edison to film. I'd love to thank Magda Katz who makes us look good and sound good and uh, Craig Horsley for being part of my producing team. Thank you very much and we hope to see you next week. <laughs>